<laughs> okay, good morning and welcome to Tartu. Uh, thank you, Weissmeier, for uh, the presentation. So before we delve into the case studies, um, I'm going to give a bit of a general idea of why we might need to improve our democracies and what then deliberative democracy in global might entail. Um, as you are here for an autumn school on deliberative democracy, some of this might be just nodding off for you and you agree, but still it might be interesting because, as some of you might have experienced if you do this, is you get challenged when you come up with a project on deliberative democracy. People will challenge you on some of uh, the assumptions that are behind it. So maybe it's a good recap um, of this. So briefly, my presentation will be why innovate, um, what, and what does this imply? So setting a bit the general scene for, um, this is Marcel Duchamp, for those of you who don't know him, he's a, the, the modern artist who uh, revolutionized uh, modern art by at some point selling uh, urinoir, uh, a urinal that he signed his name on off. Uh, and he, he's, he had this famous saying, il n'y a pas de solution parce qu'il n'y a pas de problème. There is no solution because there is no problem. You don't need to solve anything if there's not a problem. People are too much worried finding innovation when there is very often not a problem. Eh, that counts maybe for some things, but for democracy, we might say that there is a momentum uh, for change and innovation. Now, there's two ways to look at this. The first one is there are really a number of democracies that are backsliding and are really in trouble. Yes, uh, well, uh, there's one very close by, but that's been backsliding for such a long time that's maybe not a, a current uh, example anymore. But what happened in the US recently, for example, is really a show that a very established democracy can be, uh, can be in trouble. And so we need to find, that's what I call the car crash vision of democracies it's a general idea of crisis and democracies are going off the cliff, yes? Now, that's a strong argument in many places and some people here are from places where that is really the case. But I think we also have people from Finland here. These, these data came out three days ago. Um, and for example, Finns seem to still have a very general support of their democracies and their politics. Um, Swiss even more and Norwegians even more. In all those countries, you also have a call for deliberative democracy. But the argument of Finland completely driving off the cliff and democracy being gone in a few years in Finland is probably not the strongest argument. So for me, and this is also very often my more general idea of how I look at deliberative democracy, is innovation. Rather than focus on, well, in some cases this is needed, but also in these countries, the argument is also, how can we make democracy better? Rather not go like we need to replace something or something is exploding and it's the end of, of times, but also what is there in democracy that is not working in the current system we have? And what is a good way of adding something to that that just makes it stronger and better? And you know, humans innovate at the most crazy rate. Some things that you would think still work are innovated at least twice a year. But democracy for, in some cases, 200 years, also in my country, Belgium, is mostly still in the structures that we had when we set it up in 1830. We just increased voting participation for a big part, but institutionally, there is hardly any innovation. So, and then if we talk about innovating what, then if we look at democracy as of the people, by the people, and for the people, it's especially that by the people. That's the big technical problem where we've been struggling with democracies. Yes. By the way, I put human rights and fundamental rights between brackets, not because it's somewhere as an afterthought, but I always like to mention it because for me, the top part means nothing if the bottom part is not there. Right? You can do deliberative democracy in the most fundamental, technical, great way. If you don't have fundamental rights, then you don't have a democracy. So I just like to always point that out. But so the, the problem is the by the people. And for a very long time, the by the people for ordinary citizens was elections. And as we know, elections, participation has been going down. In many countries, it's also still very stable. In Belgium, between 85 and 90% still votes, because we have to. But in general, in OECD countries, it's below uh, three quarters now, which means that your ruling majority is half of that, yes? 
if only 60% votes, that means you have a majority with 30% approximately, give or take what your coalition is like, which means that 60, in some cases 70, sometimes even 80% of the people didn't vote for the ruling majority that then guides you for four or five years. As a legitimacy, that is a very thin thread, yes? For example, in the Netherlands, recent local elections, in some of the big cities, 40% came, came to vote. In some neighborhoods, 15, 20%. So in those places, you have whole blocks where maybe 7% of your population voted for the people who will then rule that place for five years. That's a very thin thread. And then even if you would look at elections, for example, we know that over those five years, actually people, many people don't have stable choices. If you would ask them who you'd vote for, this is polling data from the Netherlands, they're pretty instable. As a Belgian, it's a joke we like to say. Yes, yeah, an instable, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, but you could, you could vote. this is a few months of polling data. You know, blue party is great here, and here they're already gone, right? So whenever you hold your election, so even if you vote, just saying if you're the ruling majority, we now have five years of legitimacy, is becoming something that is actually not enough, right? Okay, but we have loads of non-electoral participation in many of, us, of our countries. What is the issue with some of the non-electoral participation? Much of it is free to show up. And decades of research has shown us that certain types of profiles are just much more likely to show up in these things. They're a minority very often. And in most of the cases, not always, and I see some people nodding, so this is not news to you, but it is very often highly educated in many societies, men, white men, so here I am. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's people like me. And many of them come for also great things. You have them in your rooms for, they will propose good things for the city, but it means they get part of the policy sphere towards them just because they show up. Second issue, and politicians in the room always nod when I give this, who comes to a meeting in the evening at the city council? People who are unhappy, angry, or just disagree with something. Which means they're also very often geared towards polarization, angriness, or you really need to move from your house to the meeting because you're so angry or... or this is okay. I mean, these, these people signal something to politics, but they should not decide. And in some cases, you really have shifts in policy because a small group is very visible, very angry, or very present in the public sphere. And so having that next to elections as the only guide might not be enough. Finally, a lot of the existing participation is, well, what is called non-participation or tokenism. If you sell, say to citizens, ah, participate, and thank you, and I will now go make policy, but it's, it's good I hear without some structured feedback or something, it actually doesn't really mean a lot, yes? You have many places that set up an online platform where they ask citizens for input, but then as a citizen, you have no clue what actually happens with that input, right? So there is really no implication, or you have no sense that it even landed, except maybe in some drawer on a desk. And so increasing the sentiment of citizens that actually, what uh, the vice mayor said, that the feeling was of these citizens at the end of the deliberative process, that actually it meant something. I was listened to is really something that we need to increase. Of course, some of you might say, yeah, but there is stuff where really people sit down. And there is stuff happening between elections, but it's with stakeholders. So most countries actually have uh, implication between elections, so there is no void, unions, um, social movements, uh, business interests will talk to and will really be heard. And this, is, this has some good things, which means policymakers get their expertise and their input. What is the problem? Even in social movements, and I, I am a social movement, we're an NGO, well, it depends on who gets funding, who can get their voice heard. Most NGOs, if you look in Brussels, we all have two degrees, we speak English, we're international. So it's also, again, very much a matter of who has the means to make yourself heard and to be at that table and have the expertise to sit with a policymaker. So it's good, 
But if you look at the gilets jaunes in France, the yellow vests, for example, part of that group was really railing against the fact that policy was made on climate by people who knew the hallways in Paris. And when you listen to some of them, you would think they're talking about the lobbyists of business, and that's their first one on their mind. But for them, it's also other lobbyists, which are environment, which kind of know the hallways in Paris, but didn't think about you know the the guy going to the factory somewhere in the countryside that needed his car, right? And they felt that decisions had been made over their head by people in uh, a smoky room. Now, for a very long time, a problem was how do you get outside of a quality versus quantity problem in non-electoral participation? Because if you talk about legitimacy, if you have something open where everybody can participate, there is a sort of legitimacy. Everybody can come. It is open to everyone. We're not selecting. Yes. If you do the stakeholder thing, it is high quality. You can do weekends and weekends with stakeholders and very intense and expertise, but you lose the legitimacy of everybody's in the room. And so in the 1970s, actually independent of each other, this is a small side story, two thinkers, uh, a professor in Germany called Dienel and one in America, Ken Carty, came up with the same type of solution independent of each other in the same month. And they didn't know it of each other. This is before Google. It took, I think, Jane, you might know, it's 20 years or something before they met each other at a conference. And they're like, hi, I'm Dino. I'm doing this. And the other was like, I'm doing exactly the same thing in the US. They came up with the idea of sortition. If you have to do a quality thing, where, for example, for a long time, Dino's was about city planning. Yes, how do you do, so you see small maquettes uh, for the, how do you do city planning with a smaller group of people without ending up with the white 50-year-old male? And you want to take them several weekends to, then they looked at sortition. And some of it was maybe the vaguely Athenian ideal, but I think someone like Ken Cardi was also inspired by just the jury system. Yes, if in the US you can do a sort of random selection for people, putting people behind bars and even deciding on the death penalty, they might also decide on how to do a renovation of a, a block in, in the neighborhood. And so the idea was use sortition together with a high quality process, click these together. So the process deliberation is something you also find in other spheres, yes? But very often it was not with regular citizens. And so this is where the combination came to find deliberative processes as a solution to that. You work with a smaller group of people because you want that high quality process and to make it somewhat legitimate and fair, you use sortition. Everybody has an equal chance to be part of that group. So this is just the basics of it and you'll get a lot more over the next two days. So what is a deliberative process? It's a random representative sample of citizens and representative is of course underlined because even you can do a sortition in a way that again you're with 20 guys like me in the room. Yes, um, You will have to work a bit to get that representative sample but you'll get more on that uh, later. You give them a clear task and a mandate. Yes, There's a, a clear question. Work on uh, our climate project. Um, for example, in Ostbelgian the first one was on healthcare. Yes, how can we make the, the situation of the people working in healthcare better during COVID? Interesting case. Um, given enough time, I can't stress this, you, need, you can't do it in an afternoon. I'll repeat this later again. They need time to look at the evidence. Yes? Balanced information. Get what is the different sides of the issue. They don't have to become experts. They don't have to become academic experts. They have to know enough to make a sort of judgment what are good choices for their community, yes? But they need inf balanced and good information. And then they deliberate. It's not a discussion, it's not a debate who wins, yes? The format that actually is much present in the representative uh, sample where it's almost who can have the better one-liner over the other one very often. And it's unfortunate. If you talk to many politicians, they will tell you they don't like that either, but it's how media and many formats work. No, you deliberate which means as a group you try to find a common solution to the problem and the task you're given. Yes? So 
this very often uh, implies that you have facilitation so that space is safe for everybody to feel that they can talk and give their opinion. Because again, people like me, I'm, I always joke, you need facilitation to have somebody like me shut up, right? Because I will talk for until you make me shut up. So deliberate, and we'll have a lot more today and also tomorrow on that. And then finally, these people work towards recommendations for policy. Yes? It's also somewhere part of the journey, and also again, uh, you will hear about this, how do you get them then to make recommendations that actually a policymaker can work with? Yes? And so this is kind of the format that you can bring in that adds something to what is missing between electoral and free non-participation. Not to replace any of these things, it is an addition, it's an innovation. What are some of the benefits, and I could talk longer than, than this, but this is just an intro, better decisions. Yes. For example, long term, there's also been research on this, a group of everyday citizens will have a longer time perspective when thinking about policy problems than politicians, which is logical, politicians have elections and they will need to deliver something. So it's not that they're vicious or something, even good-meaning politicians will need to make sure that within electoral cycles you, you can't go like, ah, oh, but that's, that will be delivered after we... So long-term decisions. And also they will be based on informed public judgment. Yes? Not a knee-jerk, quick reaction to some policy problem. Sometimes, as we also heard, citizens will say, ah, I now understand the problem better and will be much more nuanced than given 30 minutes to react quickly in a sort of you know, do or die situation during a council meeting where it's the hardest who shouts who, who makes the day. Yes? Broader participation will enhance legitimacy. If people see that people like me were involved in this decision, this enhances your legitimacy. Yes? I always say people should look at the photo of an assembly and think like, eh, there was somebody like me in there. I wasn't there myself, and some people might go like, good, because I had a barbecue or you know, I had a, a birthday party, but there was somebody like me who was part of that group and looked at uh, these decisions. It can restore trust in public actors. What we see in, in some research, for example, in Brussels, there is an institutionalized deliberative panel connected to the parliament. Recent research shows that the citizens in those groups have a better understanding of the complexity of the job of a politician and of policy making. So it restores some trust. They will also agree that it's sometimes not that easy as you would think from the outside. Um, and transparency. You have citizens looking at your policy problem, they see all sides of it, so they actually get an, a view into the small box of policy making in a certain field, so that increases accountability and it can help reduce corruption. Yes. If citizens can call for information during a meeting or say like, but we haven't seen this, it seems there is, this really actually forces you to open up the box and, and be transparent. And this works. Um, and it brings everyday citizens to the room, right? Um, these are a picture for all of the assemblies that are on the papers behind you. Um, this is, is your this is, for example, the first group in Ostbelgian. Um, everyday citizens that show up and will be there for several weekends working very hard and committed for their community. And these are case studies that will be presented over the next two days to you, but there's dozens of those. Yes? It does work. Yes? The tool of deliberative democracy, if done right, works, and citizens will show up. Yes? Now, if you're planning to do one, and this is a bit what you will be challenged with uh, thinking about this during the next few days, is, for example, well, if it needs to mean something, you will have to talk to the political level. How do you get them to commit and connect to your assembly? Commit to what? Yes. What is then the commitment of the, you know, in most cases it will not be, we will do everything that comes out of the citizen assembly. So how do you phrase that commitment, uh, that response, or that follow-up. What are good pro policy problems to tackle with this method? Yes, probably not the light, uh, you know, what color are the lights uh, at the pedestrian crossings to be red or white, yes? There are, it's a very ex 
expensive also tool in some ways. It's a very time intensive tool. When is it best to, to use that uh, instrument? How do you translate that in a good question? Yes, uh, you can say, oh, climate. But how do you then translate that in sort of policy question for your citizens to work with? Find a representative sample of citizens. How do you find these people and how do you recruit them? What information do you present? How complete or incomplete? You can't be there for months. They don't become academic experts. But what is then a good way to uh, present information to the assembly? Also, again, in a fair way, that it's not only somebody with an academic degree who understands what's been presented. So what different ways can you do that? How to make sure, and this is a very important one, that everybody in the assembly feels safe to express themselves. Yes, And this can go about very stupid. I have an anecdote from the G1000, the original one in 2011 we did, where uh, we worked with homeless uh, group, people working with homeless people. But also, we had a buddy system. And some of the questions that were asked by citizens who were recruited was like, ah, but I don't have a, a suit and tie. Um, so I, I can't show up. I'll, people will look at me and just say like, no, no, it's fine. They'd never been in a public space. And so they thought from television that you needed to be dressed up in a suit, right? And they feel uncomfortable. So very often, the first day, these people need to find a bit of time and ways to feel comfortable. So they will express themselves. It's no use doing a lot of e effort to finally get that hard to reach person in the room and that they're sitting there and then shut up for six days in a row, yes. So that's, how do you go from deliberation to recommendation? You can talk for days and days and days about a policy problem, but let's say your assembly lasts six days. At day six, somewhere you need a report with concrete recommendations. So how do you do that facilitation um, towards recommendations? It's only a small group in the room. How do you communicate with the wider public so they actually even know that this is happening? Yes, if there is an increase in legitimacy or it is also about other people kind of knowing that this is happening for them. Yes, how do you communicate and how do you relate to media? You'd be surprised sometimes media are our worst critics. Um, so they can be very cynical about this. Um, uh, you'd be surprised if sometimes you come with like, hey, we're doing this. You'd sometimes be surprised how journalists are so geared towards traditional politics that they, uh, they have a hard time uh, grasping this new thing. And for example, let's hope we don't have a pandemic like we had in the last few years again, but in some cases you might have to do parts of, you know, online because offline is not a possibility. I recently heard from somebody working in the north of Norway, this might be the same in some parts of Finland, where he said well, we can maybe have to meet one time, but the distances are so big that we can't have in-person meetings the whole time because nobody will show up. That would require uh, so much time. And how to make sure afterwards that this follow-up actually happens, right? Is what ways uh, can you make sure that there is sort of concrete milestones where um, you reflect on what has happened? And then finally, how learn lessons and evaluate? It is important because we're all still learning. This field is still pretty young and it's a strong field, it's growing, but you will need to also have some time to reflect after um, your first assembly, second assembly, and even third assembly to see, okay, what can we do better? And how do we adapt to what we are doing? For example, Ostbelgian has done three in a row, and then they had a like stop, and they had a session with all the citizens, the politicians involved, the facilitators, closed room meeting so everybody could be fair and critical um, to see like, okay, how can we make this better? I was, I was allowed in the room. None of the politicians wanted to quit. So it's an institutionalized system. So all the MPs were on board for continuing this. There were arguments too. But so also you will need to think about lessons learned. Now, this I've stolen from a Canadian colleague, Peter McLeod. Some, some of you uh, who are in the field might know him. He says it in three words, and I think it's, you cannot make it shorter than this. In all the steps you will have to take, you will have to make decisions, and sometimes you will not have the means or the perfection that you will hear from a national case here that has that had a budget of a few million euros or designed for legitimacy. In every step, 
that should be behind your thinking, even if you have to cut somewhere a bit of corner compared to an ideal situation you heard at the autumn school is in every design step, try to think how you can achieve the maximum amount of legitimacy for the resulting recommendations. So that people outside of the room think like, yeah, that's fair, that I could stand by this, yes? So that if you're questioned on legitimacy, that that's where your design steps within the means you have. If you're from a small city of 10,000 inhabitants, you don't have the means of a country, yes? So you will have to work within the means. You will also have to set up a small network, yes? Um, you will not be alone. Some of you are here alone because you're a policy officer or whatever, but if you do an assembly, and again, stealing from somebody else, it is like organizing a wedding, uh, Taylor. You, you once expressed it like that. Yes, the couple, you're two, but you involve the family, the caterer, the... So I'm not gonna go through all of this, but you will hear all of this during the next two days. You work with politicians, with your stakeholders, your civil society, the citizens in the room, the citizens outside of the room. You might have probably a steering committee, yes, that helps you make decisions because you're not the only one who takes decisions about expertise and et cetera. Uh, a secretariat, you will need people helping you just with practical stuff. Facilitators, in a bigger assembly, you will have observers, people in the room, academics who want to observe what you're doing. You will have to connect to experts, expertise that you find on your topic, um, and media, and the list might not even be complete. There's probably a few I forgot. Sometimes, in smaller cases, one person is actually doing several of those roles. Yes? In very small places, the secretariat uh, might be the same person that does part of the steering committee or the, in, a very, in a very big assembly. All of these roles are separate and need to be managed. So there's a lot of people involved. Now, what are some of the red lights in this? It, it's great. But if you want to do this because you have a great idea and if only the people would agree to say that my idea is amazing, I've talked to politicians like that, who, who just say this and don't even realize that they say this and who kind of nod that I would agree with them, like, you know, we, we really need to, and, but my city council doesn't work if I can only get citizens to agree with. You shouldn't, there should be an openness for citizens to decide on something. And my litmus test is always, you, would you agree with citizens if they come up with the reverse of what you think they will come up with? And you should still find that, fair enough, this is legitimate, I should stand by it. If you only design an assembly where you will stand next to it, if what comes out of it is something you agree with beforehand, there is something wrong with how you look at this. So foregone conclusions. Not enough time. For me, that's an important one. An afternoon assembly is not an assembly, yes? You can, a three hour assembly, you need some time, yes, for this. And I would say reduce the scope rather than rush it, yes? Especially in smaller places where your means might be limited, reduce your scope maybe, so you can present good information, etc., and with limited means try to do a lot in two or in one day, yes? Recruitment that delivered a very skewed group. After this autumn school, this should never happen again. But if you only have highly educated white men from 50 to 70 in your group, and so I could be one of those, have them debate male white privilege and just cancel your assembly, right? Just have them debate a bit. Why are only us in the room? And then maybe have them play cards or something. But then you have to redo your homework. Yes. Very biased information, yes. Um, very in a good assembly at the end you give an anonymous survey to the citizens where they can say whether they actually felt okay and free and etc yes and it one of the questions if they feel that they were only fed one side of the issue that's a really bad red light if citizens anonymously go because they might not feel secure to say it openly in your evaluation say like i had the feeling we were really hearing you know only one side of the position that's uh, a really bad sign. And <clears throat> also, for us, deliberative processes where there is no single commitment for follow-up, and we still see them being designed, where a city sets up an assembly, and there's no commitment 
whatsoever what will happen afterwards. We're doing an assembly and then the booklet is given. There's a big photo, a Twitter photo that the politician listening to the citizens and then citizens go home and have no clue what will happen. That is really also problematic. Yes? Just receiving the recommendation booklet for a press photo is not having citizens involved in your policy making. There should be clear steps and clear promises of I will see you again then and then I will tell you what happened with the work you have done. Now, I'm not going to go into this, but over time now, this field has developed very fast. Some of the things I've just given to you have been developed in quality criteria. So the OECD has a report, um, and we can give you the link, where a number of quality criteria are described with some of these red markers. Yes, And you see, for example, time is just one of them in itself. Yes, Enough time, uh, information, privacy, integrity, in this introduction, I will not go into all of them, but um, so you can find more information. Okay, over the next two days, all of this will be brought to you by seven speakers. I'll be one of them again at the end, so you uh, can forget about me for a while now after this presentation. You will get six real cases. They're um, on the board behind you. Ausbelgian is not a case, it's an institutionalized system in itself, but you will have six actual assemblies. Two cli real climate, two environmental, on, on environmental related issues. Four that were in clearly polarized environments. Uh, so you will hear about different types of assemblies. Your own town, region might not be exactly like one of them we present, but we will give you a diversity, so hopefully some of these elements will really resonate uh, with you. How do we structure the most of the sessions is the speaker will talk for about 30 minutes presenting the case and then some elements that were noteworthy on uh, how to uh, organize an assembly in their case. Then we'll give you a little bit of group time. We'll set up tables during the break now um, where in the group, you just wonder a bit, what have I just heard? Where do I need some clarifications? We have a small Q&A about clarifications about the presentation itself. Yes, something you didn't understand very well, or could you explain a bit more how you've done that? And then you will work at the table for about 20 to 30 minutes on your own situation. How does what I heard about, for example, recruitment would reflect to my situation? What would be difficult for me, what would work for me, how do I, and then we have another Q&A where we then go around the tables, and of course we cannot do everybody for every presentation, but some questions at the tables are collected, and the speakers try to reply, and then other of the experts present can also intervene in those cases uh, to give you a bit of feedback, um, and of course there's the water cooler moments during the coffee breaks, etc where you can always also approach some of us uh, with specific questions. How do we want you to leave tomorrow? Uh, you'll be a bit overwhelmed if you're new to this with all the, like, oh, you know, I don't want to organize a wedding. But we also want you to come enthusiastic about citizen participation because this is really something that gives a lot of energy to citizens who participate in it. If there's one thing all of the speakers can tell you is that afterwards those citizens are almost ready for a second one. You'd be surprised how energetic they feel to have been week, weekends talking about sometimes some very technical policy problem. Uh, so it really makes you enthusiastic and positive about citizens because we've also been very negative about citizens. Yes, citizens are very often portrayed as uh, NIMBYs, don't want to, you know, complaining, etc. But actually citizens want to be co-op. Most citizens, yes, they're less visible on Twitter because if you're okay with things, very often you don't complain. So they don't shout the hearts. But most citizens actually want to put in an effort to help build their community. And so you will bring them in a room and you'll see the energy that that brings. You will have a broad view on what deliberation can do, and I hope also what it can't do, yes? Um, so a bit where the limits also lie, but uh, what it can do. You will not be a complete expert. We cannot, in two days, make something where you go home and then you're fully, completely ready to do an assembly start to finish. 
Uh, there's a lot that comes into every aspect of this. But what we do want to bring you is you, you will know from all these different presentations, different perspectives of what to take into consideration and what to get further information on. You will still need to look things up, but you will, you will do a recruitment and think like, ah, we need to uh, think about this, this, and this, yes? So this is, but you will still need to do some work after uh, this autumn school, um, and then FIDES there and uh, other organizations to provide you with more detailed um, papers and, and documentation to help you with that. So with that, I hope I've given you a bit of broad uh, overview of the why and what we will do over the next two days.